Okay, thank you. Uh, so next, uh, we'll have Professor uh, Michael Strano um, talking a little bit about um, engineering the nanoparticle corona for sensors at new biological interfaces. Uh, I don't think he's going to talk about it today, but recently he was appearing on Science Friday talking about some of his explosion te detection technology. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, uh, definitely we'll online, it's uh, appeared a lot in the press. So. Good, cool. good. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Um, what I want to talk, talk to you about today, I want to cha change gears and talk about uh, a problem in the sensor space that no one wants to work on. And that's actually molecular recognition, general um, generic strategies for molecular recognition. When, when we move from the cell phone into the chemical realm, if we want to sense chemicals in the body, um, we have very few methods to, to get selectivity. Uh, nanotechnology is producing transducers that can get down to single molecule. I'll show you data now. We have sensor transducers that can basically count, count single molecules at room temperature in the environment. The question is, how do we make them selective? And that's the problem that, uh, that uh, is, is in need to be addressed. If you go into, into the clinic, you go into the ho hospital, uh, most of, of the assays that are, that, that are used to di diagnose you come, come from mother nature. So the, the, the workhorse in general platforms for molecular recognition come from antibodies and uh, to a lesser extent aptamers or uh, adaptive, uh, adaptive ligamers. Um, nature makes these molecules to be transient. So you, your body makes antibodies, they're designed to be broken down. But we use these and we expect them to function in the environment. We want them to last years, we want them to. So and they're, they're, these by far make up the lion's share of, of uh, generic molecular recognition platforms. There, there is a technique called molecular in, in printing. It works uh, some of the time. You basically polymerize a polymer around your an analyte. It makes more of an adsorbent. But there's, what I want to argue is that there's a, there's a pressing need for synthetic, stable, non-biological molecular recognition sites. That, that's really the, the missing need in the, in the sensor space. We have transducers that go down to single molecule now. So we, we've invented technology from my lab. We, we call it corona phase molecular recognition uh, or, or cough more, corona phase molecular recognition. And I can explain it. Um, many nanoparticles, you saw carbon nanotubes are featured heavily in the sensor space. There, there's a reason for, for, for that. Um, polymers, like this amplifile, will absorb around a carbon nanotube and solubilize it into a solution. So we call that absorbed layer uh, a corona. So you're supposed to be seeing the, the rays of the, of the sun. And the, the misconception in the colloidal community is that this, these corona phases are disordered like noodles. Okay, so noodles can't recognize anything. Uh, but if you do the following empirical experiment, if you make a library of these polymers, and you make a library of corona phases, you do an experiment that actually shouldn't work. You can screen that library against uh, an analyte library. And what you'll find is very exquisite cases of molecular recognition. And we call that corona phase, uh, corona phase molecular recognition. Uh, and it's very, very new. It's, um, we're using, in this case, I won't talk about the transducer. We're using a near-infrared fluorescent carbon nanotube. It's a nanoparticle. It fluoresces in, in the infrared. And we look for changes in its intensity and changes in the wavelength length shift to indicate that a molecule has, has bound. And at th this point, over the past four to five years, we have um, ample ev evidence that this can be extended to a wide variety of, of molecular species. Uh, but I'll give you a few exa ex examples. They really are surprising. So this, this molecule, which is very simple and unassuming, it's a polyethylene glycol con connected to two hydrophobic fluor fluorophores. This molecule sits on the carbon nanotube we know in this loop. We call this anchor loop uh, corona phase. This, this polymer will recognize alpha and beta estradiol with exquisite selectivity. So we're not talking about uh, um, an, an, an orthogonal do dog nose type, type of interaction. It makes a molecular recognition site that's very so selective. This is an analyte library, and you're seeing a relative fluorescence change. If I mutate this chemical structure to another anchor loop, you see the selectivity go goes away, and it starts to look like uh, just, ju just this lipid peg. This mechanism works at the nanometer scale. I'm sorry about the lighting here. You're supposed to see a, a carbon nanotube, and you're supposed to see the actual change in the corona phase at the single molecule level. You, you, you can see the deformation in the corona phase as a single estradiol molecule comes down and, and, and binds. 
I have a lot of examples of, of, of this. That this is a corona phase that recognizes riboflavin. And again, it's exquisite selectivity. So it will recognize riboflavin, not other pendant diols, not FMN, things in your body that look like riboflavin. You get exquisite selectivity just for riboflavin. And it's from this polymer that a chemist otherwise uh, would not be able to predict that this polymer, when mapped to the carbon nanotube, gives you this molecular recognition. Uh, these probes have immediate biological uh, utility. You can put nanoparticles nanopar into the, um, into these are raw macrophages. And we're actually looking at, so the, these cells, th this cell has uh, our nanoparticle probes uh, inside, inside of it. And you're seeing in real time, spatially and temporally, uh, riboflavin di diffusing and, um, and changing its concentration through, throughout. So uh, we've extended this method to, uh, to carbohydrates, to proteins, to um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you some examples of analytical cha challenges that now we're solving. Uh, we have, I had a, a postdoc, Seb Sebastian Krauss, he was interested in neuro, neurotransmitters. Uh, there is no optical reversible sensor for, for dopamine until our work. And, and this give, gives you a sense of what a Kofmor screen looks like. So these are neurotransmitters that uh, Seb Sebastian screened against this is a first round Kofmor screen. These are different corona uh, phases, different polymers that we've wrapped around the carbon nanotube. And the red is a fluorescence turn on and the blue is a quenching. And you can see here that the corona phase uh, str strongly regulates which neurotransmitters bind to the, sur to the sur surface. We found this really strong turn on sensor for dopamine. It actually has some cross reactivity with epinephrine, but, but actually it's the first optical reversible sensor for, for dopamine. It has wide, wide utility. And you, and you can see here, the, these are carbon, these are fluorescent carbon nanotubes dispersed on a, on, on a surface. And if you add, let's see, oops, sorry about that. If you add, uh, if, if you add one, one micromolar of do, dopamine, you see a very, very bright turn, turn on response. And you can do this, you can cycle this r repeatedly. Each nanometer scale particle uh, gives an independent, exquisitely sensitive uh, sensor for, for dopamine, which you, you can show uh, goes down to the single molecule. Basically, it has a single molecule de detection limit, which I will show. So recently, in a paper that just came out earlier this year, we solved a major problem in dopamine de detection in and around a, a neuron. So the, the, the only other way to detect dopamine directionally around a neuron is to use electrodes. And the record to date is four electrodes. If you put any more, you get cross reactivity. So we have here in this blue, we have 20,000 selective dopamine uh, sensors that, that are optically addressable. We put a neuron on, on top. And this is, actual, this is actual data. If you stimulate the neuron with an action potential, this is happening in, in your brain um, right, right as we speak. Um, if I have, so so then if you take a look, you what you see is it's it's oh, it's not not playing here. So that, that's good. Okay. Well, you you'd see a very beautiful uh, turn 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 on turn on response. I'm, I'm gonna try try this. We did. Let me just try this. Try th this again. Well, you'll have to you'll have to come to our website. And you'll see what you'll see is that in the footprint of the cell, you see spatially and temporally um, the 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 dopamine emission uh, events. Uh, in space and time with exquisite precision uh, all around the outline uh, of the cell. Uh, okay, what, the, uh, you can detect down to single molecules with many nanosensor transducers, but a fluorescent carbon nanotube is, is one. We've done a lot of work detecting nitric oxide. Here you're seeing single nitric oxide molecules binding from the bulk in real time. This is actually, or not, not in real time, but at, at room temperature uh, in the environment. You can basically make a nanosensor transducer that can count um, individual molecules. We've solved the detection limit pro problem. There's no concentration below which you, uh, the sensor doesn't work. So the, the question is making it selective. And we've, we've made a nitric oxide sensor. Nitric oxide is a chemical signaling molecule used in your body, and it's very, very difficult to detect. So, so, we've, so we, we, we were interested in this to, as a way of, uh, of de detecting these chemical signaling path pathways in the body. And then I have a, a large part of my program is focused now on making 
uh, sensor tattoos that operate in the body in, in vivo. So we're using Coughmore to make fluorescent hydrogel sen sensors that can be placed uh, in, in tissue. We're working on, on glucose, we're working on insulin. We also have a program on cortisol and progesterone. And the idea here is that you can use the, the near-infrared uh, fluorescence of the sen sensor to monitor these analytes in, in real time using uh, Coughmore molecular recognition in these in these uh, hydrogel beads that are easy that are easily put um, in, inside tissue. So we have a fairly extensive uh, murine pro program. This is a paper that, that we wrote in 2014. We, we put our sensors for nitric oxide uh, into A129 mice and we actually uh, showed operation of the sensor for more than 400 days. It's actually the longest any nano sensor to date has ever been demonstrated in, in, in vivo. And at, at, at this point, we, we have um, mice that spend their entire lives with these nano sensors um, in, uh, uh, in their, uh, their per peritoneal cavity or in the hind, hind flank. We, we have very, very healthy di diabetic mice. And so, but you can see here that, the, that, that, that this op operates over four, for, for, for 400 days. So uh, a remaining challenge that I'll talk to you about, so this is a paper also that, that just, came, that just came, came out. So what's an analytical ch challenge? Could we, could, we detect a single, could we detect single proteins coming from a single bacterium? Imagine that. Um, from a sea of bacteria, uh, could we detect the chemical emission from a single bac bacterium? That's an analytical challenge, uh, and uh, we recently published this in Nature Nanotechnology. Um, this is work from Marquita Landry, who's now a professor at uh, Ber Berkeley. Uh, I can forgive her, she did not want to use Coughmore. She wanted to use aptamers, which actually are very difficult to use. Uh, she did get partially uh, an aptamer corona phase to work. Uh, what she showed is that um, if you have any hope of getting this, this aptamer, which can recognize uh, an analyte, you need to use what's called an abasic spacer. So she wraps the nanotube in DNA, she puts this abasic spacer, you, you have to screen and find the right length, but if you do, you have a hope of, of getting your aptamer to, to, to work. So, so here she, she looked at uh, H, HGH, HIV, V1. She, she could only really get uh, an aptamer to recognize the analyte. Here, here's the aptamer on the nanotube. Here's the, an, the, 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 the analyte. You're supposed to see here, she was only really able to get two bright turn-on responses for this HIV-1 and this RAP-1. RAP uh, the rest uh, failed no matter what the a, a basic spacer was. But the, these two make, make a very, very nice, uh, for, for the cases that work, uh, turn-on sen sensor. Whoops. And here she illustrates actually the advantage of a nano sensor that's, so, that's so, so, so selective. Yep, I've got, if, if you take, take a look. So if I take the sensor and I have it on a substrate, if I add up the signals from all of these sensor signals uh, here, um, I, I get an analog response curve. And just like any other sensor, um, many of which you've seen today, there's a concentration below which you can't distinguish a signal from, from the noise. So there's a concentration detection limit in this mode. However, if you then look at just one, if you optically address just one car, uh, nano sensor, you can actually count the stochastic fluctuations. Every molecule that absorbs and desorbs, uh, you can actually uh, count and you, you can plot now the first passage arrival time. And this actually scales down, it goes down to single molecule. Uh, you don't get anything for free. It means that if you have to wait exponentially long, if there's a molecule in this room and you want to, to, to detect it, if you're willing to wait long enough, you will detect it. But it's still a significant advance compared to where we were uh, 10 years ago. So this is what nanotechnology ha has given us. It's basically the ultimate detection limit. And so what Marquita has, ha has done, she, she can see that you can look at a single bacterium and uh, these are E. coli and they're, they're emitting the RAP1 pro protein. You can see here in the, in the red, you're, you're seeing sensors lighting up from single proteins coming from that single bacterium. And so th this is an exquisite detection limit uh, that's demonstrated. And Marquita um, went, went on to basically do some new, bi new biology. Uh, she showed that uh, when the, the bacterium are, are dividing, they, they actually stop their protein production. They, they actually put their, their metabolism towards re, reproduction um, but before they, they resume effluxing protein. And this is, this is intuitive, but you can really only study this at the single organism level. And, and so that was, 
uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, an, an, an area of, of my lab where we're, we've figured out how to get nanoparticles to traffic inside living plants. And so I, I have a new initiative in my, in my lab where we're, where we're trying to use nanoparticles to transform living plants, um, giving them non-native function. So can, can we replace the things we make out of circuit boards and stamp out of plastic with a living functional plant that has its own energy source and it can be recycled and it has, it has, um, it, it, it has uh, lower cost? So here, uh, relevant to today, um, I've, I've turned really any wild type plant. We've, we use uh, spinach, but you, you, you can use any wild type, type plant. Uh, we've turned it into a chemical se sensor by, by putting uh, two nano, nanoparticle se sensors inside the leaves. Um, if you put, we demonstrated that if you put explosives in, in the soil, uh, they'll be taken up by the plant by transpiration. They'll activate a, um, two, two se sensors, a reference and an infrared and we'll send that to, to, your cell, to, to, to your cell phone. So I have a quick, this is my, my last slide, and this video does work because we did check it out. Let's see, okay. And this is, so this is a, a spinach sensing plant. Um, so this is, these are two nanoparticles placed um, in the mesophyll of the living plant, and uh, we've done the detection with, uh, with just a, a basic cell, cell phone camera. This is picric acid being added to the, to the soil. Within about 10 minutes, the, the plant will take up uh, this, this water containing the analyte uh, through the roots, through the stem, and into the mesophyll. We have a sensor that acts as an infrared reference, and this is just a Raspberry Pi system. It re represents a very low cost. This is essentially the optics in, in, your, in your cell phone. And you see you have a reference, and you have a nanoparticle spot that, m that modulates as the nitro aromatic is detected, and then it can send, your, your, your plant can, can send you an email. So <laughs> with, so, with that, uh, I would like to thank my collaborators and thank the organizers of today's event. Thank you very much.